Okay. Can everybody see a, a slide, a presenta presentation slide? Yep. yep. Good. All yep. right. So welcome to this uh, launch event for the Agricultural Genome to Phenome Initiative. I'm Pat Schnabel, the, the PI of the project and the director of the Plant Sciences Institute at Iowa State uh, University. I want to begin with uh, just sort of a few rules, rules of the road. Uh, first, please mute your mic. Um, the chat function is open, so you can use that. Um, several speakers will ask you to reply to one or two uh, simple questions after they complete their presentations. You can answer those questions using the URL that uh, Nicole will post in the chat box. So that's either there now or it will be, uh, it'll appear uh, after the first speaker who asks questions. And you can use that URL after the meeting is over. So if you want to uh, answer questions at more length, you can just do that after the whole thing's over. Um, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the event. So um, to get your questions uh, queued up for that event, you can send them to Nicole using um, the chat box. And there are a lot of names in that uh, chat box list, but if you just start typing her name, it'll, it'll pull it up to the top of the list. The event is locked, so if you leave, you won't be able to come back, or you may not be able to come back. Um, and next week, the, um, we'll have a link to this recording of this event at the AGT2PI uh, website. So we've got a, a, a whole list of presentations for you today to introduce you to the uh, Agriculture Genome to Phenome um, Initiative. Um, but I wanna begin by uh, introducing uh, Dr. Parag Chitnis, who is acting director of USDA, USDA's National Institute for Food and Agriculture, or, or NIFA. Uh, Dr. Chitnis received his PhD from UCLA he served as a faculty member at Kansas State University and Iowa State University, where I got to know him. Um, and during that period, he authored over 110 peer-reviewed scientific publications. He, he left uh, academia to become director of the Division of Molecular and Cellular Bio Biosciences at the National Science Foundation. And then he became deputy director of the Institute of Food Production and Sustainability before becoming associate, appointed associate director of NEFA. Uh, and more recently, he was appointed, as I've said, acting director of, of NIFA. And Parag, I hope you're on. And if so, um, you're welcome to uh, make a few remarks. We'd like to hear from you. And if you're speaking, you're muted. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue, and Parag, if, if you are able to join, uh, just jump right in and, and I'll pause and, and let you make your remarks. So um, if you're on this call, you're probably very familiar with what uh, genome to phenome research is all about. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, talking about this, but basically it is understanding how genotype and other influences such as environment management practices feeding trial uh, feeding practices and so forth influence uh, phenotype and what makes this particularly uh, complex is the interactions among genotype and the other factors so th the overall goal here is to in in um, g to p research is to understand the how genotype and these other factors influence the phenotype, but also to build predictive models so that knowing genotype and having characterizations of these other factors, we can predict phenotype. And the promise of this research is that it should increase the rate of genetic gain and enhance our ability to efficiently breed crops and livestock for novel traits, should improve our ability to provide farmers with evidence-based recommendations, and increase agricultural profitability and sustainability for the benefit of both producers and society. So what's required to realize this vision? Clearly we need data and we need a lot of data, phenotypes, genotypes, environment and management practices 
to collect those data, we're going to need new phenotyping technologies, and we're going to need new ways to analyze the resulting data. We also need a community of very interactive biologists and engineers, data scientists work together. And we'll need substantial new um, R&D investments. Uh, for example, the Agricultural Genome to Phenome Initiative. Now, I'm going to use an example from Iowa State that I'm familiar with about the ability to develop a community of scholars that spans biology, engineering, and data science or computational science. So this is um, about five or six years ago, I was appointed director of Iowa State University's um, Plant Science Institute. And we undertook an approach to build a community of scholars that would work on uh, predictive plant phenomics. And in this graph here, um, I've indicated the scholars that are involved in this effort, and they're color coded by their major area of expertise and interest. And each line in this graph is a documentable uh, evidence of interaction, a shared graduate student, uh, co-funded grant, uh, co-published papers, and so forth. So it's, it's certainly possible to build these tight collaborations among these disciplines. And I know similar things are going on at other universities across the country. And this is clearly essential as we move into a new era of agricultural uh, genome to phenome research. We also need data. Um, the livestock industry and the academic, um, the animal science departments have worked very well to share data from um, production environments that the uh, researchers can use to connect genotype to phenotype. In the, in the crop world, that has uh, been much less of the model. And so uh, the Genomes to Fields initiative was set up as an example. This is for corn, but it was, it was designed to collect data that the public sector researchers could use. So collecting both genotype and phenotyping data that could be used to understand this genome to phenome uh, equation. So with a large multi-state, multi-year data set, uh, it began in 2014 and the, the data are being made publicly available and they're enabling researchers to do some very interesting studies about the relationships of genes, environment and, and crop performance. But I bring up this initiative, the Genomes to Fields, because it has been, it was critical in beginning the effort to get funding for the Agricultural Genomes to Fields initiative. So since 2016, Genomes to Fields, its partner universities, the National Corn Growers Association and the Iowa Corn Growers Association have been lobbying for increased federal funding for agricultural genomes to phenomes research. And more recently, we were really pleased when, the, when other crop specific groups and the livestock groups joined this effort. And due to this community-wide effort to convince Congress that this was an important area that needed new funding, not redirecting existing funding, but, but new funding, uh, the Farm Bill uh, that was signed into law in December of 2018 authorized $40 million per year for a genome to phenome initiative to be administered by USDA NEPA as a competitive grants uh, program. Now, for those of you that have done this sort of thing, you know that authorization is not the same as appropriations. So it is appropriations that actually provide the money. And um, recently, uh, this, this past year, um, 2020, Congress appropriated $1 million of the 40 for the uh, HE2PI. And NEFA acted uh, very quickly and prepared uh, and released an RFA on the 5th of June uh, with a deadline of the of 15 July for a single project. And the group of people that you will be hearing from today uh, worked on preparing a proposal which eventually was selected for funding. The title was Creating a Shared Vision Across Crop and Livestock Communities. And the uh, PI team includes faculty from uh, Iowa State, the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, the University of Arizona, and the University of Idaho. And we include plant scientists, livestock scientists, and data scientists. I also want to um, mention David Ertl, 
uh, who is with the Iowa Corn Growers Association. And although he's not part of the PI team, he was instrumental in setting up Genomes to Fields and worked with us closely on that. He's been very involved in, in the lobbying efforts uh, to get funds for this. And he's also a key player in the um, AG2PI uh, project. And you'll hear from him later today. So the, the first thing to emphasize is this is not a research project. We didn't get funding to conduct research on AG2PI. Instead, the goal is to assemble a cross-kingdom transdisciplinary community and then prepare this community and members of this community for an anticipated large-scale R&D effort in AG2PI. So our objectives are to develop a community vision for agricultural genome to phenome research, identify shared research needs across crops and livestock, identify the opportunities and the gaps, and then support seed projects, small seed projects, not research oriented projects, but projects to outline community solutions to these research challenges that exist and that have been identified as part of this project. And then communicate and disseminate the findings from all of these activities to the research community and to the USDA to uh, further engage the research community and then also to advise the USDA on, on what the community thinks needs to be done and the sorts of solutions that we're looking for. And they'll use this as they develop uh, future RFAs. So the activities that we have outlined for this three-year project, and they're, they're primarily going to be virtual, um, are field days, conferences, training workshops, seed grants, a community survey, uh, survey and you're going to hear about each of these activities in the subsequent talks here. And then we're guided by a, 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 an internationally renowned scientific advisory board, partner organizations, and external stakeholder group. And you're going to hear uh, something about, about those external groups too. So with, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Jack Deckers, who's going to speak about the um, field days activities. So Jack, it's all yours. Okay, thank you, Pat. Um, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, wherever you are. Um, so Nicole, if you can, I'm sure you're working on that, sharing your slides or my slides. So as, as Pat indicated, we have a number of activities. Um, so if you can go to the next slide. Um, and um, so I will be uh, leading, you see the, the team listed there in the middle of the page. So um, different members of uh, subsets of the PIs, uh, co-PIs are leading um, and are uh, coordinating the different uh, activities. And I'll be leading the field days, um, team and uh, other members are Eric Lyons, Brenda Murdoch and Pat Schnabel. And so these will be uh, field days in quotation marks because they will be virt virtual. Um, you could also call them virtual open houses. Uh, and, and the goals of these field days is to expose our communities that are interested in genotype, genotype to phenotype research related to uh, agricultural species to expose um, the community to the different, the, the great diversity of research activities and resources that exist and that are ongoing across crops and livestock. Um, there's, there's a lot already going on that is um, focusing on genome to phenome uh, of agricultural species, uh, but not all of us are aware of everything that's going on and we can learn a lot from each other and get ideas of things we could potentially apply to, uh, to the species that we're working on. So that's uh, one of the main goals. And in the process, you know, share research methods, share approaches and share capacities for genomics, for phenotyping, for phenomics and, and so on, as well as uh, capacities for uh, analysis and management of data. 
Um, and in the process, we will identify, likely we'll, we'll identify research and capacity gaps, um, either to specific species or across the whole community, and identify challenges for genotype to phenotype research in the uh, agricultural um, communities that, that need to be addressed if, if we want to embark on this large scale effort of um, making this a reality and capitalizing on the hopefully additional funds that uh, um, USDA will be making available. And then also uh, bring teams together. So a lot of this, this grant is about building networks, building communities uh, of, of researchers and stakeholders that may traditionally not have worked together, but that can together bring a lot of uh, novel things to the uh, to the to the problem and 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 hopefully come up with solutions and and we'll start that already through the seed grants but you know one of the steps in in, in that process is to identify the challenges and to bring the teams together and the conferences which you'll hear about next will also uh, target those kinds of uh, outcomes so the deliverables will be identified gaps needs and challenges which will also feed into uh, white papers that uh, we will be writing uh, for USDA and the government and um, research teams, newly formed research teams that can tackle genotype to phenotype research. Uh, next, Nicole. So um, this will go on for the entire three year period of the grant and we are scheduling a field day uh, one, one per month. Uh, this is officially the first field day. Um, and uh, we will schedule that every third Wednesday of the month from at this time, from 10.30 to 12 uh, um, US Central. Uh, realize that not everybody will be able to make all these, uh, uh, these time frames, these, these meetings, but Again, we will record them and there will be opportunity to uh, view the recordings and to provide feedback on the recordings. Uh, the next one will be <clears throat> November 18. And that will also be uh, not a, a demonstration of research capacities or research efforts, but we'll talk more about, uh, we'll have two uh, uh, or several consultants who will be talking to us about uh, how do you communicate across disciplines? And, you know, and that's one of the issues we will have to uh, um, uh, deal with is, you know, if you look at crop geneticists and livestock geneticists, to some degree, we speak a different language. And we also will have to communicate to engineers and to data scientists, uh, even uh, uh, including uh, social scientists and econ economists that will all be uh, uh, important in um, making genotype to phenotype uh, a reality. So how can we facilitate or how can we communicate across disciplines? And this is something that I think all of us can, can benefit from because we all do that uh, in our daily lives, in our daily work. Uh, and the second one is how, how can we make these virtual meetings work to our benefit? How can we now, if we have a, we now, right now we have hundred and over 175 people on, how can we get set up an environment where we can engage everybody into thinking about uh, the problems that we will be looking at? Okay, so that field day, hopefully uh, there will be more information coming out, but uh, please uh, mark that uh, uh, date in your calendar as well as the other third Wednesdays of every month for, every, for the next three years, um, because you'll have something to uh, participate in every, every month at, the, at that time. Um, so that's for the November 18. Um, we have a list of possible topics for field days or virtual open houses, so you know, research of, of activities and programs that we are aware of that we believe would be useful for the entire community to become familiar with. But we don't want to drive it from our ideas. We want this to be driven by ideas that come from all of you. And that's why I have question marks with all the, the future field days. And what we would really like you to do is uh, 
let us know which topics or programs, research programs, phenotyping programs, or whatever programs uh, that uh, you think are relevant to uh, genome to phenome, uh, the, the genome to phenome effort, and that you think others from the community would be useful, uh, uh, would be useful for them to learn about. And that could be your own program. So don't hesitate to you know, promote your own program. Uh, and like, we'd like you to go to this website, which uh, this URL, and, and I think Nicole is going to put that in the chat to um, in the next little while until we finish. Um, and even after that, it will be open is to uh, send us your input. You know, what topics or programs would you like to see featured in a, in a field day like this? Um, and with that, um, and, and you'll have similar opportunities for the other activities that we will talk about to provide input like this, like this on the uh, on the on the on the URL that will be provided. Uh, I think I think it may actually be the the same uh, the same URL, but you'll get more information on that later. So please go to that URL, put in your uh, uh, your your thoughts, your ideas, and uh, and if you have questions for me. Um, just put them in the chat and we will deal with those at the end of the presentations. So uh, Pat, that's it for me, thank you. Good, well thank you very much, Jack. Um, now Parag Chitnis uh, has been tr having trouble getting in. If he's by any chance made it in, um, we could uh, let you uh, give your presentation now, Parag. I think you're still stuck outside, but I wanna give you the opportunity here. All right. Um, well, we're sorry uh, not to be able to hear from you today, Parag, uh, but we very much appreciate the, um, the support of, of NEPA for this project and, and generally. And I want to say how much we value NEPA's um, real commitment to seeking community input as you design your RFAs. Let's go on to the next speaker. Hi, I'm Carolyn Lawrence Dill. I'm in the departments of genetics development and cell biology as well as agronomy at Iowa State University. And I'm going to be talking about conferences that we have put together for AG2PI and how that's going to work. So um, on the left hand side of this slide, I'm going to go over the goals first. What we want to do through these conferences is to build community to develop the vision for uh, what AG2PI and what just this area of research looks like, how we can work together across different species. And then we'll be communicating and disseminating findings from these conferences. The lead on developing conferences is Chris Tuggle, who you'll hear from a little later. Um, also, Jennifer Clark and Brenda Murdoch are on this team and myself. What we want to develop out of this uh, activity is white papers publications, and self-organized research teams. Let me talk about that topic of self-organized research teams in, in depth. If you look at that figure that's on the right, the dots that are in dark blue and that say interest species, what that indicates is that within a particular type of research, within plants, within animals, within maize, um, et cetera, we're really talking within our own groups most of the time. That's how we write grant proposals. Then we also have these different areas and different tools and uh, perspectives that apply to any given species that include cyber infrastructure, bioinformatics, data sharing, statistics, and other related fields. What we want to do is to be able to um, mix those different groups together. Nicole, would you go to the next slide, please? So the figure that you see on the left is not the one that you've been looking at. I've updated that a little bit and I want you to just follow me around that cycle. So starting on the left, you see where it says year one in hot pink, it says virtual. Of course, we're doing things right now that are virtual. In this first year from that black dot, you see that what our goals are is to articulate our research and development opportunities within the crop and livestock communities and to identify gaps in knowledge, infrastructure, protocols, and coordination to do this kind of work. And you see the same dots that you saw on that previous slide, interest species, and then these other overarching areas that apply. And still, we're, in, we're expecting to be um, 
from our starting place where we work now independently. So what we're going to be doing in that first year, if you look on the right where it says multiple types, we're gonna have larger conferences that are enabled by professional facilitation for organization. And that's gonna allow us to create mixed up breakout groups that bring those different disciplines and areas of expertise together so that you actually meet individual other people so that it's not just um, us with a megaphone trying to get information out there, but instead it really is a collaborative activity and we learn to work together in this first year. The outcomes of that first year are going to inform the second year. So if you look back over to the figure, um, in year two, we know we will still have virtual get togethers. We're also hopeful that we'll be able to have some that are face to face. We're going to be able to, out of work that's done in year one, organize our conferences around seed grant based demonstrations and developing white papers. By that point, we should have developed some new teams around those uh, seed grants and activities so that these new types or start types of teams are starting to form in these bubbles. Each of the conferences that we have are going to be front loaded. And what we mean by that is that there's going to be a good bit of asking you what you see, what you would like to see happen in these meetings so that we have the meetings designed to address the needs that the community sees, that individuals see that we may miss. We're also going to be working to make these monthly workshops track on what it is that the larger conferences look like. Those outcomes from year two, if we go back to the image on the left, are going to inform year three. We still think in year three that the conferences are going to be virtual as well as face-to-face. -face. We're going to be doing a lot of reporting out with white papers, creating findings and opportunities for funding. And then these teams that have assembled, we anticipate that not only will they be um, viable for the funding that comes out of NIFA, but from lots of different funding agencies. So we're hoping, we're imagining, we're um, pretty sure that once those teams get together and work together, they will be able to write proposals together, do research together, and advance the field of genome to phenome for NIFA, for our own research, and beyond. And with that, I will direct you to the uh, survey where we have a question on what kinds of things you'd like to see at conferences, things that have popped into your head at this time. Do come back to that survey later and fill it in again or in addition to what you've already put in after the meeting today is over. Thank you, Carolyn. Now we'll hear from Eric Lyons, who's a data scientist at the University of Arizona, about training workshops. Hi, everyone. I'm Eric Lyons. I'm, I'm at the University of Arizona. Um, I'm, in the, I'm a professor in the School of Plant Sciences, School of Information and Biosystems Engineering. Um, and I'm also one of the co-PIs on a project that is a partner for uh, AG2PI called Cybers, which provides cyber infrastructure and training resources to life science researchers. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the training workshops are an integral part of the AG2PI. Um, we want to have these being held continuously throughout the entire project. Um, and Caroline did a great job of, of going through um, all the different components of this. Um, and next slide. And in terms of this committee on workshops, um, I'm the, the lead of it, uh, and I'm doing this with Jennifer Clark and Chris Tuggle. And what we want to do with these workshops is to really do two things. Build our technical and methodological strengths, as well as help the community identify future collaborative opportunities. And the way that we're doing this is through workshops that are going to be held monthly. And we want to have these workshops target researchers from all different types of, of backgrounds and computational skill levels. And we want to emphasize developing and sharing best practices, common vocabularies, and these technical expertise uh, that are required to really make progress towards genomic and phenomic problem sets. Um, next slide, please. 
So what we're planning is to hold about one workshop a month. And we want to have a mix of what we call long format workshops and short format workshops. Um, the idea is that a long workshop could be anywhere from two hours to maybe a couple of days. Of course, those couple of days could be uh, all at once or they could be broken up into multiple sections, just depending on what we can do to engage the broadest set of people um, that might be interested in it. Um, short formats, we want things that are around maybe one hour to two hours. And importantly, these are going to be held virtually. We want to ensure that we can, as best as we can, accommodate as many people from all over the country and all over the world to be engaged with this. And in order to do that, we want to make sure that everything that we develop is made open and easily available, um, recording these things, making them available through YouTube, and written tools and documentation. We want to make sure that they're available as well uh, through common uh, systems such as read the docs um, or, or other activities. Next slide, please. So as we have been thinking about our first set of workshops, um, and this is, is um, not set in stone, and we really want to encourage the community's feedback in terms of, of thinking how we can best engage people, is we want to make sure that we're taking a long-term view. So we want to start out um, by building some of the basic skills. As was emphasized earlier, um, we want to bring together the animal and plant genome to phenome communities, along with data science of all types, be it information science, computer science, um, machine learning, um, so on and so forth, as well as engineering of all types. And so what we imagine for these first two workshops, which will be a longer format, is that one of them will be focused on bringing biologists into the computational world for those that don't have very strong computational backgrounds. And we envision something that's very similar to a carpentry style workshop to introduce biologists to the basic computing skills that they'll need for conducting G2P research. And this would include things such as you know, how do you get started on the Linux command line, basic data management, intro to some of the commonly used programming languages and environments for conducting this work. And similarly, we want to make sure that we're engaging and getting uh, computational scientists and engineers interested in these problems. So for that second workshop, instead of it being, let's bring biologists to computers, what we want to do is bring those computational engineering scientists to biology in order to understand the underlying problems that are within this genotype to phenotype space. And so the goal here is to introduce these computational researchers to the basic biology that they need to really understand this with such learning outcomes as what is DNA? What is this thing that we call the central dogma? What is the basics for genetics? And ultimately, how do all those fundamental processes come together to create these things that we call phenotypes. And what are some simple examples of that, such as you know, eye color or hair color? And what are some of these complex examples, which are the core focus of what we're working on in terms of improving um, agricultural resilience to stress, um, as well as ultimate yield or other beneficial traits? Next slide, please. And so from then, after we sort of have that basics laid out, then we want to start focusing on some very general examples and short workshop formats for how to do some common G2P analyses. And so the two that we picked was genome-wide association studies um, and genomic selection. Um, one of these is, is often used in the plant world, one of these is often used in the animal world, and this is now an opportunity for people to get together and actually get one of these analyses done and see how the crosstalk may happen across these biological domains and then putting into practice what the biologists may have learned in terms of basic computing skills and equally important, um, the computational scientists and the engineers trying to understand the, the scientific implication or the knowledge discovery that is yielded from these types of analyses in terms of understanding biology. Next slide, please. And for the, the next set of workshops, um, now that we sort of have those, those basics down, we can start working on maybe more detailed um, processing of these data. 
So maybe a couple of short workshops, one of them focused on how do we generate variant data? How do we identify all those underlying DNA changes that are important for understanding the genetic variation happening in plants and animals and how those then eventually could be fed into these GWAS and genomic selection experiments. And similarly, when it comes to uh, phenotype data, a lot of what we're working with now are large scale and high throughput imaging. So let's engage um, the computer scientists and the data scientists in terms of how do we leverage computer vision, image informatics, and machine learning in order to identify features out of lots of images, um, not just in terms of using those models, but also start to understand some of the general basics around transfer learning, really what goes into building models in terms of training data, um, so on and so forth. Next slide, please. And so we have generated a long list of potential workshops. And these were things that were just developed by um, the folks that, that uh, are on this uh, proposal, or sorry, on this award. But while we have generated a list, we realize that this is probably vastly incomplete. And what we really want your input in is what are the areas in addition to this that we want to put in there, as well as your thoughts in terms of how do we best structure these in order to bring along as many people together in terms of accomplishing this. Next slide, please. Um, so key to these workshops is we want to involve everyone here, plus more people that are not on this call. We want to get the community involved. And so there are two key questions, or two and a half key questions that we'd like you to answer, um, which you can do on that feedback form, which is number one, what are the workshops that you would like to see? And similarly, what are workshops, um, would you be willing to teach a workshop? And if so, on what topic? And one of the things that I wanna emphasize about these workshops is that it's not just about where do I go to learn something, we also wanna emphasize the opportunity to build collaborations and build teams. You'll be hearing from Jennifer Clark after me on the seed grant um, opportunity. And these workshops is a great way for you to identify uh, people and technologies and tools and methodologies that would be beneficial for bringing together um, an interdisciplinary team to go after one of these seed grants. And similarly, if you have the opportunity to teach, and it doesn't matter how little you think you may know, as long as you know something about this and you might be able to bring in some other people to help, this is a great way to get your name out there. This is a great way for people to identify you for some of these future projects. And it's a great way to engage in some of these um, preliminary parts to move into a collaboration in terms of having some conversations offline, sharing your expertise, learning about what someone else is doing and bringing all of these things together. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to email me. My email address is up here. It's ericlines at arizona.edu. And as these workshops get formalized, as we get our schedules together, we're gonna to be posting them on the website. Um, that's ag2pi.org. And there's gonna be a tab, there is a tab at the top called workshops and you can just click on that. Um, next slide. So again, please, everyone who's here, I would really appreciate it if you would take that moment, not just to um, give feedback on all parts of this, but to give a little bit of thought in terms of workshops you'd like to see. And please let us know if there is something that you can teach, um, even if it's a little piece of it, we can start to bring people together um, and um, let us know what we can be doing to help bring this forward. And with that, I'll, I'll pass it along. Thanks, Eric. So our next uh, speaker is Jennifer Clark, who's a statistician at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and she will talk about the SEED grant program. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, as Pat very kindly said, uh, my name is Jennifer Clark. I'm a professor of statistics and food science at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Um, I also hold leadership positions in the North American Plant Phenotyping Network and the International Plant Phenotyping Network. So uh, next slide, please. Hi, so today I wanted to talk a little bit about the seed grant process. Um, this slide is intended to give you an overview of the timeline of this project. And you'll see on seed grants that, uh, as I'll discuss a little bit as we move forward, that 
the call for C grant proposals will come out in year one. Uh, the C grants will be managed, uh, proposals reviewed, awarded in year two. And uh, year three will be reporting from C grants, providing results back out to the community. Next, please. So the organizing committee uh, is pretty much everybody on the PI team. We're all very involved and interested in the C grant process. The overall goal is to promote collaboration and support the development and cross-pollination of tools, data, and ideas to enable and facilitate future genome to phenome research. Uh, and because this is a cross-disciplinary award involving both the plant and animal sciences, a key area of emphasis is this cross-pollination uh, across the plant and animal genome to phenome communities. The C grants, we would like to foster first steps towards the development of community solutions. So this is your voice, your input, uh, your expertise to um, identify solutions to existing research needs and opportunities, identify gaps in physical infrastructure that we should help to address, and uh, developing capabilities in data processing, data analysis, and data management. Next, please. So uh, our key activity at the moment is to develop and operate uh, a C grant mechanism. So we are currently forming a C grant steering committee that's composed of representatives from our participating organizations. And you'll see at the bottom of this slide, I have a graphic showing that if you visit the AG to PI webpage, you can take a look at the current participating organizations and institutions so you know who's represented on that committee. We will release um, an RFP and provide a web-based platform for proposal submission. Um, we'll conduct a peer review process of all the submitted proposals and then select and notify awardees of seed grants. Then our role is to monitor the award progress. So if there's any challenges, issues that we can help to overcome, please let us know. If you achieve something fantastic, please let us know. We'll uh, collect the deliverables and uh, the final reports from the awardees and then do an evaluation process of the entire mechanism. Um, did we achieve what we wanted to achieve? Uh, did we enable the community to move forward? Um, are there ways that we could improve the entire process for everyone's benefit? Uh, next, please. So a bit of the timeline for C grants. So uh, this year, um, currently, we are developing and will release the RFP. Uh, the, the goal is to release this next month, so November of 2020 with a submission deadline uh, at the end of this calendar year. We have um, $120,000 available that we will be awarding. And so the anticipated award sizes um, is somewhere between five and $10,000 total cost. Uh, seed projects are intended to have a timeline of six to 12 months from initiation to completion. Uh, we are soliciting proposal reviewers from the members of this community, and I'll, I'll mention that again at the end, where there's a link you can um, put in your information if you're interested in serving as a reviewer. Uh, we'll have a clear rubric for the review process, uh, which would, should help make the reviewing more standard and, uh, and easier, to, easier for um, participants to do. And uh, we'll match uh, potential reviewers to the proposal. So we'll match on expertise um, to make sure that each proposal gets um, an informed and expert review. Next, please. In uh, next year, uh, assuming that we move on, on track and proposals are submitted by the end of this calendar year, we'll do the review process early next calendar year, um, select proposals for funding, we plan to notify awardees um, and provide feedback on submitted proposals. 
um, start our C grant activities and monitor progress. And as the seed awards uh, projects move forward, we'll provide deliverables back to the community. We are um, hopeful that we'll be able to support a second round of awards, um, but we're sort of waiting on that at the moment, but um, we're planning to have a second round if that's at all possible. Next, please. Uh, and in 2022, we'll um, collect all the results from the projects that were awarded. Uh, we'll provide access to the deliverables through the um, project webpage. We'll do an assessment of the grant mechanism to provide feedback to the USDA and the community. And we'll draft and release a final summer report on the C grant process. Um, and if we're lucky, we'll proceed with um, a second round of, of C grant awards. Next, please. So here's an, to give you an idea of potential C grant topics. As already has been mentioned, this award is not primarily research. It is doing activities that support research or support the community. So examples, uh, workshops, webinars, or training activities that address capacity building. So as Eric mentioned, we're soliciting ideas for training activities. And if you want to develop something to offer, um, then a C grant might be the right uh, fit for you. We have, uh, you could offer to explore methods to enable data sharing while maintaining privacy, which um, I know is a, a concern for the agricultural community in particular. Support community meetings to explore fundamental research needs. Are there fundamental discoveries that we should focus on in genome to phenome? Uh, you can propose to deploy accepted data standards or ontologies around genome to phenome data, define best practices for data sharing, explore strategies to improve genotype to phenotype prediction, um, identify needs in phenotyping tools and technologies, uh, quantifying the value to US society of investments in this area of research, uh, or propose to uh, write white papers on ethical, legal, or social aspects of agricultural genome to phenome. So this is not prescriptive in any way. This slide is purely to give you some ideas around the types of activities that you might propose to do uh, with C grant support. So it's not at all limited to this. It's just to give you some ideas of scope. Next, please. So what would we like um, from you as the community? Uh, we'd like to hear suggestions on what C grant topics would you like to see? Are there specific activities that you think is impor important for us to support? And are you uh, willing to review proposals? We know that each and every one of you has important skills and expertise um, to bring to Ag Genome to Phenome Research and activities. We'd love to have you participating. Um, so please use the link in the chat um, to provide your information and your area of expertise if you're interested in serving as a reviewer. Um, I, I have my email up here. It's jclark3 at unl.edu. Feel free to reach out to me uh, with suggestions and um, comments. I'm more than happy to hear from you. And uh, I have it here on the slide a link to where you can get additional information um, about the C grants from the project webpage. Um, so I encourage all of you to participate um, and make the C grant mechanism as successful as possible. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Jennifer. Okay, our next speaker is Brenda Murdoch from University of Idaho, who's going to speak about the uh, partner, the founding partner organizations. And I believe she'll also be joined by David Ertl. Thank you very much for the introduction, Pat. So I will be talking about uh, uh, foundational um, partner organizations and, and there's a lot of them. So I'll be going through these slides, hopefully not too fast, but relatively quickly. So next slide, please. So there are 11 uh, founding partner organizations, all of which that are represented on this slide. And you can uh, find this information also on the AG2PI website. Next slide, please. So uh, just going alphabetically, uh, the first, um, one of the first founding 
partner organizations is Ag Biodata. They are a consortium that consists of over 150 uh, database scientists from more than 30 genomic genetics and breeding databases. They work together to ensure standards and best practices for acquisition, curation, visu visualization, and retrieval of genomic genetic and breeding data. We have a number of activities that they are involved with, including workshops and monthly meetings, as well as newsletters. Next slide, please. Uh, breeding Insight is a program that determines breeding programs, and specifically, they address specialty species, including rainbow trout, Atlantic salmon, blueberry, sweet potato, alfalfa, and table grapes. They provide resources by making connections, uh, more specifically, genotype platforms and providers to data management, as well as phenotyping to data management. They also deliver software considerations, uh, various components that are available and needed uh, for the functionality of specific breeding uh, purposes and, and uses. Next slide, please. Cyverse, formerly known as iPlant, its mission is to design, deploy, and expand national cyber infrastructure for life sciences research and train scientists in their use. In their, use. their vision is to transform science through data-driven discoveries. Um, and you heard a little bit about this from Eric Lines earlier. They have over 32,000 total users and 4.8 petabytes worth of data on their system. Um, over 1,200 citations to date and have trained close to 45,000 people. They've run over 3.7 million jobs. Next slide, please. Um, next is the animal annotations to, uh, or sorry, the functional annotations in animal genomes project, coordinated international action to accelerate genomes to phenomes. This group is really a core partner of scientists that are engaged in uh, FANG initiatives. And you can see up in the, the top um, uh, map, which really sort of highlights the breadth of this group. Um, there have a number of different projects in the US as well as Europe. US FANG projects total over 9.5 million. We start with a number of uh, smaller projects, including a pilot project, um, and they include a number of species oriented projects, so sheep, horse, and some larger projects looking at functional annotation of the bovine genome and sheep as well as porcine. In addition, there are a number of projects from the European side. Uh, totaling greater than 19 million euros. Uh, there's a number of ongoing projects there right now in the European Horizon 2020 initiative. And there's three projects, one which is sort of a porcine and chicken called Gene Switch, as well as both Reg and Aquafang. And so there's also a number of white papers that are cited here um, if you're interested in more, learning more about the Fang initiative. Next slide, please. Um, the fields, uh, the Genomes to Fields initiative, you've already heard a little bit about from Scott Schnabel, so I'm not gonna really talk a whole lot about that other than to mention that they are also a partnering, partnering organization. Next slide, please. Midwest Big Data Hub is an agricultural community that is growing um, its network of partners and devoted to par building partnerships and resources that will address emerging issues in precision agriculture, uh, ecosystems management, and services. This network um, is really invested in data and data sciences to address grand challenges for society and science by collecting, managing, serving, mining, and analyzing rapidly growing and increasingly complex data and information. Next slide, please. National Association of Plant Breeders work to improve plant and improve lives, um, improving plants. They show that plant breeding is dynamic, problem solving, and creative. They communicate the value of importance of plant breeding to food security, quality of life, and the sustainability of the future. 
provide professional development opportunities for their members and facilitate public and private sector interactions. They advocate for plant breeding research and education. Next slide, please. The North American Plant Phenotyping Network is a nonprofit organization of scientists and researchers that rapidly, um, that, that rapidly um, work in the evolving area of plant phenomics. And you can see by the uh, um, Venn diagram here, they bring together a number of different um, disciplines in order to address best practices, facilitate communication, funding, outreach, recruitment, research, training, and visibility of plant phenotyping. Next slide, please. National Animal Genomes Research Program, NRSPA, has been a group that's been together for approximately 27 years. Their work mainly re revolves around uh, the species that they represent, including cattle, sheep, aquaculture, um, horses, pigs, poultry, and data and bioinformatics. They've leveraged over 95.5 million um, since their inception and developed a number of different tools. The objectives of this group is to advance reference genomes for all agricultural animal species, to advance genomes to phenomes predictions, and advance analysis, curation, storage, application, and reuse of large data sets. Next slide, please. The NCCC 170 is also a multi-hatch group. Um, the title of this group is Research Advances in Agricultural Statistics. We've been a group since 1990, and their mission is to address a series of statistical topics. Overall, their objectives are centered around identifying, fostering, and coordinating cooperative research efforts in statistics among statisticians serving food and agricultural research projects or programs. They provide continuing education and statistical support to the scientific community. They address statistical designs and analysis issues associated with studies involving large um, number of spatially or temporally correlated observations. They address concerns associated with the development and implementation of generalized linear mixed models. And they address meta-analysis issues associated with multi-location multi and multi-investigator projects. Next slide, please. And last, certainly not least, is the USDA Agricultural Research Services. Their mission is to deliver cutting-edge scientific tools and innovative solutions for American farmers, producers, industry, and commodities to support and nourish and the well-being of all people. This group, there's over 2,000 ARS scientists that conduct problem-solving research through over 660 intramural projects. They have laboratories in a number of different locations throughout not only the nation, but uh, the world as well. Uh, ARS research is enhanced through their partnerships, through their attention to Grand Challenge Synergies and ARSX, Reading Insight, Egg Data Commons, AI Center of Excellence, Cynet, and Partnerships in Data Innovation. Um, those are all of our um, founding partner organizations, um, and we really like to thank everybody um, for their support. And in addition, before we move on, I just wanted to mention that we also have a group of world-class um, scientists that uh, support and contribute to our scientific advisory board. All right, thank you. Um, David Ertl is now gonna talk about the external stakeholder committee. Well, hello everyone. I am David Ertl and I work with the Iowa Corn Promotion Board as well as the Iowa Corn Growers Association. And as Pat mentioned earlier, the corn growers have been very interested in genome to phenome research because they're interested in leveraging the huge investment made in genomics and uh, want to see those improvements and that knowledge translated to improvements on their farms. So as a member of a commodity group, I'm excited to be able to participate in this project by bringing together a broad coalition of like-minded stakeholder groups 
to participate in as well as provide guidance to this project. So let's take a look at the roles of this committee. Um, one of the um, identified roles will be to ensure that the work of this project is applicable to and useful to not only the science community, but also to external stakeholders as well. The purpose of this committee is to review the objectives that have been laid out for this project and to ensure that there, these activities complement existing work in the area, area of plant and animal genome to phenome work and ultimately meet stakeholder needs, in particular the needs of genetic suppliers and producers. So this committee will be asked to evaluate the outcome and potential impacts of the project activities and plans as we go along. And I'll also be asked to help evaluate progress toward goals and timelines and deliver an evaluation report annually to, back to the project as well as to the US NIFA program. So um, we've assembled a group of several commodity groups from both the animal and plant kingdoms and um, let's take a look at who those are. So next slide, please. Uh, we have several bovine groups involved, the National Dairy Herd Improvement Association, the Council on Dairy Cattle Breeding, National Milk Producers Federation, National Cattlemen's Beef Association, and the Beef Improvement Federation. Next slide. Other two and four-legged species, the National Pork Board is represented, as well as the National Swine Improvement Federation. Uh, American Sheep Industry Association, and then the Poultry Breeders of America and the U.S. Poultry and Egg Association. And on the plant side, we have uh, the American Seed Trade Association representing seed producers, uh, Cotton Incorporated, National Sorghum Producers, National Association of Wheat Growers, National Corn Growers Association, and the United Soybean Board. So these groups will be uh, assembled shortly and uh, begin our work to provide input and evaluation of this project. So. Thank you, David. And as the slide shows, Chris Tuggle is going to make the last presentation before the Q&A session. He's an animal scientist at Iowa State University and he is going to talk about the survey that we hope you will all participate in and share it with your friends and colleagues so we can get uh, lots of input. Chris? Thanks, Pat, and I'm really gratified to see so many people um, are still on the call. That's wonderful. Uh, I, I'm a, a member of the Department of Animal Science, and, and I'm also the National Swine Genome Coordinator for the NRSP8 uh, project that Brenda mentioned uh, a moment ago. So can we have the next slide, please? So uh, what I'd like to do is, is highlight uh, an activity that we think is very important. Um, it really cuts across all of our activities, as you've um, noticed, that we're extremely interested in getting opinions from the community and, and understanding um, what the uh, value and interests are for uh, the community for genome to phenome. And so one of the um, initial activities that we're uh, planning to run is a, is a survey an online survey where the purpose is to collect that community opinion. Uh, and that will be as broad a, 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 a survey as we can make it. Um, the main purposes of, of that information or the, the uses that we'll take of that information from your uh, opinions is to guide our future activities uh, and also provide content for conferences. As um, uh, Carolyn mentioned before, we were planning to, to take that information directly to uh, front load our, our, um, our conference activities. So next slide, please. So just to give you a quick um, uh, indication of the survey as we're pl currently planning it, I uh, would like to identify and understand your knowledge of genome to phenome and, and your knowledge of what the current genome to phenome resources are that you use. Uh, again, uh, one of the major interests is, is try to understand what the ongoing genome to phenome research gaps are that you identify, but also the opportunities that you, you uh, identify and, and that, those that you'd like to pursue. 
and just as several groups have, uh, several of, um, uh, of the speakers have talked about today, uh, we're really interested in, in identifying those people that are, are uh, willing to par participate and, and volunteer their um, knowledge and, uh, and their time and effort uh, to help the community. Uh, again, uh, or, or in addition, we'd like to also um, find your opinion of these first year activities. Um, you've been now introduced to, to everything that we've been planning um, for the first year and, and on. And so we'd like to get um, your opinion of those and where you might see some suggestions that you could make. Uh, we'd like to also look at um, your suggestions for how we can improve participation um, what groups that are missing or, or, or need to be uh, emphasized more, as well as how you see um, additional ways we could disseminate the, the information that we're collecting. And then finally, uh, we, we want to get some demographics of, of each of the respondents to the survey, and so we'll collect some information about, about you and, and um, your background uh, in the survey. Uh, overall, the main thing is, is really to collect your suggestions for how we would move ahead. Next slide, please. So just a quick schedule um, of what our plans are for this first survey. Uh, we I anticipated opening on December 1st, and that will be widely disseminated. Uh, we'll have it available for at least two weeks. Um, we hope to close it um, before the holidays. Uh, and then we will be able to analyze the data uh, through mid-January uh, mid or so. Because the intent is to try to get this information out as quickly as we can back to you and, and to the uh, USDA. So, so we'd like to contribute to a white paper perhaps as early as February. So just to conclude, I just want to say definitely participate in the survey. Um, everyone that's on this call is a workshop registrant. And so you will be directly sent the survey. And anyone that joins uh, AG2PI, um, because we'll have your contact information. So. So um, please encourage others that are not on this call or didn't register for the workshop uh, to join uh, uh, at the website. And that will really um, make, make sure that we uh, can connect those people that, that um, uh, have, have registered. Uh, and then we will also be also looking at uh, connecting with as many different societies as we can and, and try to make this as broad a survey as possible. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Um, while Nicole gets uh, organized to start the Q&A session, I'll address one question that I got in a private chat, um, which was, how uh, extensive is the community and, and how can international partners participate? And this one's um, uh, very clear. We, we want as much engagement and participation from scientists in this research space anywhere on the planet. Um, we want you to uh, participate in the surveys, share your ideas, join the workshops, the conferences, and so forth. The, the only uh, restriction here is that the seed grants have to be led by US groups because the money has to stay in the US. But I suspect, and I'm not, I'm not sure we've actually addressed this question uh, formally, but I suspect um, a US-led seed grant proposal could have international participants. They just couldn't get any money. Um, Jennifer, do you want to comment on that? Would that make sense? Yes, Pat, I believe that's, um, that is the case, that uh, we can have international collaborators um, with usually a U.S. Uh, lead PI, and uh, the funds need to stay in the U.S., but we uh, encourage our international partners to participate for sure. Good. Nicole, do you have uh, questions that you can share with us to answer? Yes, Pat, I have another question for you. Um, and that is, is there a membership model in place? Okay, so um, we have uh, several ways. Uh, individuals can join, as Chris said, simply go to the website and give us your contact information and you will uh, get on our mailing list and, and be a member of, of the activity. Um, for organizations in this space, we have the founding uh, participating organizations that Brenda went through, but we welcome additional organizations that represent scientists in this research space to, to join us. Um, one of the key roles of those organizations and, and their um, ability to participate here would be to help uh, conduit information uh, from AG2PI out to their members. So th those, are the, those are the models for membership. Thanks, Pat. And I have a question here for Eric. 
when and where will the registration for the workshops be posted? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, I'll definitely say that we don't have that system set up yet, but our, our plan will be to do a similar type of advertising as we did um, for this uh, um, field day slash workshop. Um, and we want people to do the same kind of thing in terms of registration. This will allow us to do our counts, uh, make sure that people get the Zoom links. Um, similarly, all these workshops will be posted on the AG2PI website um, under the workshops tab. Great, thank you. Pat, I have another question for you. Is there any relationship planned um, to coordinate with the plan animal genomic meetings in San Diego? Um, yeah, I think this is this is something that uh, some of my uh, co-PIs could talk about. Um, certainly, uh, workshops, uh, conferences, and so forth could potentially be coordinated uh, with PAG. Um, you know, so much depends on what happens with coronavirus, I think. But anybody else uh, like to make a comment about potential coordination with PAG? So this answer, it's complicated, I think, is the answer. So go ahead, Nicole. Oh, Caroline, did you want to add something before oh, I go on to the next question? We actually have on the PI team three people that uh, work with PAG directly and we're on the organizing committee. So this is something that we really can pull together as it makes sense is to uh, get situations in place in the future so that we can work together with the PAG group. Great, thank you. And I only have one more question so far. So if anyone else has anything they'd like to send, um, please do. And so I'm just gonna open this up to all the PIs um, and I'll, I'll let you um, decide who wants to answer, but is there any intention, eventual or otherwise, to support cross-platform initiatives like data sharing and analysis between platforms such as Cybers? DOE, K-Base, JGI, Ensemble. That sounds like a great proposal for a seed grant. That's exactly the sort of thing this uh, activity is, this initiative is meant to do. Yep. Yeah, Pat, that was something I was just going to say, was that those are the types of activities that we would like to see supported uh, we recognize that there are strong and well-supported established databases that have direct relevance in the genome to phenome space. And one of the challenges is connecting those resources uh, for those um, individuals who are interested in doing broader research projects that you know, integrate as much of the da available data as possible. So get getting um, existing resources in the data space to talk to each other uh, and make it easier for researchers to access the data and <clears throat> match data from different platforms would be um, a great idea for uh, a seed grant project. Okay, great. So I have another general question that might be um, for David or Brenda. Has there been any um, attempt to reach out to the wheat community specifically? Yes, if you um, if you define the community as the the broad grower commodity groups, we do have the National Association of Wheat Growers who have already signed on with a letter of support. Um, if you're referring to the scientific wheat community, um, I would hope that they through one of the various networks we've reached out to, we'll be aware of this and uh, engage that way. Okay, and then- There's also a question about, uh, oh, go ahead, Nicole, looks like you saw it. I, yes, I was just gonna ask that. Um, so I'll just read what's written here. For collaboration and funding opportunities, how would this initiative work with USDA ARS? Um, or a scientist um, within there, because there are a lot of limitations um, in terms of federal funding. Um, so let's, let's start with that first half of the question. That maybe be a Jennifer question. And or Carolyn, since she knows the USDA inside and out. Well, 
while, while they get their thoughts, to, oh, go ahead. I think, I, I believe that you're right. It's a little complicated um, to support USDA scientists with USDA funding. So I'd have to explore how, how that could work. I mean, we definitely want that to happen. Um, I'm just not, not sure about what, if there are any, it would be on the USDA side if there's restrictions with, with sharing. I'm not aware of it, but I will definitely look and see if, uh, if there's a way to enable that. And Jennifer, they could certainly serve on a, on a seed grant um, if the money, if there were, if the PI were, were a non-USDA scientist, right? Correct. There's nothing yes. to preclude their participation. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. Maybe I could add just uh, my experience with that. I mean, I have had subcontracts that go to ARS scientists um, from a USDA NEFA grant. So I don't see a problem with getting funding from a NEFA, NEFA grant going to an ARS scientist. Okay. That's great, Chris. And then it looks like the next okay. question has to do with the engagement. Um, and, and what are the plans for um, like an engagement webinar to reach out specifically to USDA scientists um, or uh, like educational opportunities for middle and high schoolers um, and, and different um, like crop communities? Again, I think this is probably a subject for a seed grant, Jennifer, don't you think? Yes, if, if, they, if we want to do, you know, if the proposal is to do specific activities, they're targeted at, um, at, at specific sub-communities, then I would say yes, then that's a good proposal for um, a C grant. You know, if there's a, if there's a specific participating community that is, um, that we feel we should be pushing engagement that, um, that really feel they feel like we should get them more involved and do specific outreach, then I would encourage the, the people who feel best positioned to do that to apply for a, a C grant to do that, to do an outreach that's more specific to a, a, a participating group. Yes, Pat, I would just like to add that uh, USDA ARIS are a part of our partnering organizations. And so they will be um, part of the steering committee and, and welcome, and we welcome their input um, throughout all of the process. So we will be looking to uh, engage more with that group of scientists. Just uh, back, back to the previous question. Uh, I think our general philosophy is that any scientist or any organization that was eligible to apply or to obtain funding from the, the NIFA RFA that generated or that, that this is funded on is, is uh, eligible to re receive funding uh, under uh, the seed grant program. And I believe ARS scientists uh, are included in that. So. And I'll just reiterate because there was, was another question um, Anybody in the world is, is welcome to participate in the activities, the training courses, the workshops, the field days. All of those activities are going to be wide open and information will be posted on the website. We'll be sending information about these activities out to the mailing list. Um, this is one of those wonderful things that has the potential to bring the world together. We need the best ideas from every scientist on the planet to pull this off. So please participate and please share this opportunity with your colleagues because we, we tried to get the announcements out very broadly, but we're, we're aiming uh, for a very large community here. So please help. Any other questions before we close? Those are all the questions that I have received. All right. So I see there is there is one other question that is in the chat from uh, Bangladesh from Dr. Rahman from Bangladesh about um, well he's working he's in a case of working with high throughput phenotyping systems of rice for stress tolerance how can I participate in the workshop training and so on and I think yeah like Pat said anybody the workshops are open to anybody but also if if you believe that this would be um, a, a useful topic for for what you're doing. 
a useful topic for um, a field day, you know, please feel free to suggest that in the URL. Exactly. All right, I would like to thank all of you for, for joining us today. Um, and this is not gonna be the last time you hear from us by any means. And you know, share your ideas. Uh, we would, we're, we're very excited about this. This is a, this is a huge challenge uh, on many different levels, but we've got a great team here and with your help, I think we can pull this off. Thank you very much. Have a good uh, day, evening, morning, wherever you are. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, everyone.